So I welcome all of you in the room and all of you who are watching us online and some of you are listening to us on a podcast so you can't even see us but you can hear us and we're glad you're there. And this is Systematic Theology class, the third one, number three. And in your notes we're on page 15 which is Roman numeral five. We're continuing with the subject of bibliology. And bibliology is the study of the Bible. So that's what bibliology means, the study of the Bible. We're on Roman numeral five. But before we talk about Roman numeral five, I want to review just a little bit. Uh, last week, we covered quite a bit, I know. And we talked about, I guess we were on page six last week. And we talked about revelation inspiration. That was Roman numeral two. And we saw that revelation and inspiration are two sides of a coin where revelation, God gave us his word and man heard it. And inspiration is where men recorded God's word using their personalities and style and they recorded it. So revelation, inspiration, and we saw out of that that our scriptures are inerrant, which means they have no errors because God originated them and he superintended the writing of the scriptures so they were done without error. And that's extremely important and that's called inerrancy. And you can summarize, summarize that as God tells the truth, or God's word tells the truth. And we saw a third thing is illumination, and illumination is when the Holy Spirit helps us understand the scriptures, understand the scriptures, and that's illumination. And tonight, we're going to be talking more about revelation and inspiration a little bit, uh, and then we're going to continue on from there. We also saw, flipping a few pages, to page 10, Roman numeral four, the canon of the scripture. Roman numeral four, page 10. And canon is Greek for rule, and that's a measuring rod. And we saw that the canon tells us which books belong in the Bible. So there were a lot of different manuscripts and documents and things that people wrote. And how do we know which ones were scripture and which ones were just religious or devotional or maybe fanciful, not even true. And so someone had to decide which documents were going to end up in our scriptures because we saw last time that the Bible was written by at least 40 different authors over a period of 40 generations or 1600 years. And so all those documents had to be collected and put together into what we call the Bible. Because the Bible wasn't just a book like this written all at one time, written over a period of 1,600 years, so it had to be compiled. So to know which books should be in the Bible is the study of the canon. And we saw that the Old Testament itself, different books of the Old Testament authenticate other books and other prophets. And then in the New Testament, we have the New Testament quotes almost all of the Old Testament authenticating those are the correct books. And we saw that Jesus authenticated the collection of the Old Testament books himself. He referred to them. And we also saw that the Apocrypha, which is a group of books that find, found themselves in the Catholic Bible and the Greek Orthodox Bible, were never referred to or quoted by, by Jesus or by the Jews never recognize the Apocrypha. So they're not part of actually the, the inspired scriptures and they weren't added until 1546 AD during the Protestant Reformation. And so that's the canon that we know which books should be in here and we talked about that last week. Well this week we come to page 15, Roman numeral five, an overview of how we got our Bible. And I'm going to use a, a chain link diagram here. We have one, two, three, four, five links on a chain. And they're going to illustrate the process of how we go from the mind of God, what God's thinking, he wants to get his thoughts into the mind and the acts of man. And by man, I mean men and women, of course. And so God wants to get his thoughts into our thoughts, and he wants that to affect our actions. So what did he do? Well, we have this different, these different links of the chain. And the first link is the one that we talked about last time. It's a link of revelation and inspiration. That's the first link. 
And looking at your notes there, Revelation, you'll remember from last week, is the giving of the truth by God. The giving of the truth by God. That's revelation. And so that's part of God's mind getting into your mind. He has to reveal what he's thinking. And then the other part of that link is inspiration. And inspiration in your notes is the recording of that truth by man without error. The recording of that truth by man without error. So revelation, inspiration, they go together. God reveals his word and he breathes it out so that man records it and he does it without error. So this first link is absolutely flawless and unbreakable. A flawless and unbreakable link is this first link in getting from God's mind to your mind. But of course, you weren't there. He didn't inspire you. He didn't reveal his word to you. So there's another step in the process of getting the Bible to you. And that's what we call transmission. And if you look at your notes, transmission is the process of copying the original writings as accurately as possible the process of copying the original writings as accurately as possible. So when we come to the second link, we come to the second link is transmission. And let me ask you, listening online, people in the room, is this link flawless? It's a link of copying and making copies of the original manuscripts that were in Greek, Hebrew, and a little bit of Aramaic in the Old Testament. But most people say Greek and Hebrew, but there is some Aramaic. Had to be hand copied, no photocopies, hand copied over and over again over a period of hundreds, even thousands of years, or a thousand years or more. Um, so transmission, I saw some heads. Is this one flawless? No. There could be errors in copying. And that's why your maybe unbelieving friend or skeptic friend might say, well, we can't trust the Bible because it's been copied over and over and over again. And we're going to tell you a very good answer to that. But if you don't know the answer, then you go, oh, they make a good point. And like I mentioned last week, maybe it's like playing telephone and you say something around and by the time it comes all the way around, it says something different than you meant. And so they say that's what happened with the Bible. Well, one, it wasn't oral, it was written. But there's some reasons that we know that the transmission was very accurate. And I think I can do this, flip this over. Once I figure out how. There we go. In the, so we're gonna talk about the Old Testament and the New Testament manuscripts. First we're gonna talk about the Old Testament manuscripts. How do we know that the Old Testament manuscripts that we have or what God gave. Well, when the Jewish scribes hand copied the Old Testament, so they would hand copy it, and let's have a, a copy, an original, and they would count how many letters there were on the original in every column. And they would write that number, they would know that number, whatever the number is, 30, 35, 32, 41. And then when they made the copy of this, they would go and count all the letters in every column of the copy and make sure there were the same number. If there's 30, there's 30 there. If there's 35 in the original, there's 35 in the copy, all the way down. And they would make sure they had the same number of letters in each column. But not only that, they would count every row and do the same thing. So make sure they had the same number of letters in each row. And if it wasn't exactly the same, they would destroy the copy and start all over again that they've been working on. Start over. They weren't in a big hurry. So they were extremely meticulous about the copy. So when people say, oh, well, they told somebody and he told somebody and it got changed, it goes, well, then you don't understand how the manuscripts were copied. Now, could there be an error here? Yes, there could be. And most of the errors that come in will be a spelling error. 
because you're, you're not likely to have the wrong word, you're very unlikely to leave out a word because you're counting the number of letters in each column and each row. But someone could say, well, how do we know that's true? Well, when you talk to your skeptic friend and you want to convince them that this is true, you just have to say three words. And when you say those three words, you have demonstrated that these copies were copied almost flawlessly. Do you want to know what those three words are? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Dead Sea Scrolls. Dead Sea Scrolls. In 1947, there were some shepherd boys, and they were out in Israel, and I forget exactly where, but they were out there watching their sheep and their goats, and one of them got lost, and they're trying to find it, so they start throwing rocks up on the hill in a cave. They didn't want to climb up there and see if the goat's in there and the goat will come out. They heard something break. Well, like any good boy, they ran. <laughs> no. Um, they heard something break, and so they went in there to see what it was, and there were these huge clay earthen pots filled with scrolls. And there's a whole story about how this was found out and what happened to these scrolls and how they were sold, you know, and, and the classified ads and how people didn't really want them. But they turned out to be these amazing documents and they found a series of caves and there's somewhere between 900, up to 900 scrolls that they found. And the scrolls were from these people called the Essenes and the scrolls were dated approximately... 100 years before Jesus Christ. 100 years before Jesus Christ. And in those scrolls, they found portions of the Old Testament in Hebrew and some other languages. And they found portions of every book in the Old Testament with the exception of the book of Esther. Esther sometimes wasn't well liked because the name of God is not in the book of Esther. And so Esther might have been there, it might have decayed, it might have been stolen, it may not have been found yet, but they found Old Testament Hebrew manuscripts for every book of the Old Testament except for the book of Esther. They also found the entire book of Isaiah, the entire book of Isaiah. Well, what they did was they compared the Dead Sea Scrolls from 100 B.C. from the oldest Jewish manuscripts, they're called the, the Masoretic, text, and they compared the Dead Sea Scrolls to the Masoretic text. The Masoretic text is from about 900 AD. So, doing your math, that means there is a 1,000 year gap between the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Masoretic text, copying, 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 copying for 1,000 years. And they discovered there is no significant difference, no statistically st difference between these copies. Um, some misspellings or some change in spellings, some minor things, but the Dead Sea Scrolls pretty much verify, or they do verify, the accuracy of copying for over a thousand years here. So when says, someone says you can't trust, and we're just talking about the Old Testament now, they say you can't trust the Old Testament copies, just say, what? Dead sea, Dead sea Scrolls. Okay? I'd like to show you a comic strip um, on your next page, 16, and I, I'll just read it, and I don't know, maybe I'll change my voice to, to be the characters. But the, the first one, you see Linus, and he's scribbling, he's copying a Hebrew manuscript. Those are uh, Hebrew letters. And uh, then you have Lucy and Linus and Charlie Brown walking to school, and Lucy says, oh no, this, this is show and tell day at school, isn't it? Rats, I forgot to bring something. Did you remember that this was show and tell day, Linus? Yes, I have a couple of things here to show the class. These are copies I've been making of some of the Dead Sea Scrolls. See, this is a duplicate of a scroll of Isaiah chapters 38 to 40. It was made from 17 pieces of sheepskin and was found in a cave by a shepherd. Here I've made a copy of the earliest known fragment ever found. It's a portion of 1 Samuel chapter 23, verses 9 to 16. 
I'll try to explain to the class how these manuscripts have influenced modern scholars. Very interesting. I thought it might be at least faintly appropriate to the season. Are you bringing something to sh for show and tell, Charlie Brown? Well, I had a little red fire engine here, but I think maybe I'll just forget it. <laughs> so, the importance of the Dead Sea Scrolls, even Linus understood that. So that's, that's the Old Testament. Well, okay, well, what about the New Testament? Can we trust the, the copies of the New Testament? Well, the New Testament was copied differently. It wasn't counted all the way through, and people made copies, and they spread all over the, the world, these copies. And we have today, we've discovered, and this number obviously changes, but the last time I saw the number, it was 5,664 Greek manuscripts. Manuscripts, in a plural, is abbreviated MSS. So we have over 5,644 Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. Um, some of them are the entire New Testament. Some of them are portions of the New Testament. And so we don't just compare one or two documents. We have all these documents of the Greek New Testament over a period starting from about the 2nd century A.D., 3rd century, 4th century, 5th century, going on, um, these copies of the Greek New Testament. And we can compare them to one another. But in addition, we have another 24,000-plus manuscripts in other languages as well that are old and ancient. They might be in uh, Ethiopian. They're in Latin. They're in, I got to look at my notes, I forget. I'll throw my head. Oh, Slavic, Armenian. And they're from different ages too. And so we can see what they did. And on top of these manuscripts, then, we have what are called lectionaries. And lectionaries are like Sunday school lessons that quote scriptures. And so you look at the lectionaries, and you can find the scriptures too. And so we have thousands upon thousands upon thousands of Greek manuscripts of the New Testament dating as early as the second century. Um, and so we have all these, and it's like you can compare them all. And... The process of comparing these and deciding what was probably the original is called textual criticism. Textual criticism. It's a science. They follow certain guidelines and certain rules to figure out which is the proper text. Now, you won't be able to see that this from there, but this is my Greek New Testament. And... Uh, I don't know, maybe on the camera they'll see it, but I don't know if you can see on a page we have, it's kind of divided up and down. You got, you got the text in the Greek on the top, and below it is called the textual apparatus. And what you have down here that I'm pointing to, the textual apparatus, that tells me all the differences in the manuscripts of the stuff that's right above it. Okay? And so it just tells me, it goes, well, this, and it tells me all the documents that have, have it, this word, and some of them have a different word. And so it'll tell you that maybe one manuscript had it in plural and the other one has it in singular. Or one manuscript inserts this one little word and another one doesn't. And so they've done all this study and you have it. So I can tell you from my Greek New Testament what all these manuscripts think about the text. But I don't make the decision. Some smart people then make a decision and say, well, what's most likely to be the original text is what they put in here but I can see what they chose, what they didn't choose, why they didn't choose it. Nothing hidden here. That's the Greek New Testament. So going back to our chain here, this is the chain of transmission. And it's uh, the process of copying the original manuscripts over and over again. But then, how many of you read Hebrew well? Anybody? Okay, a little bit over here. How many of you read Greek well? Anybody? Okay, so we're at a disadvantage. If, if the chain stopped here, we still haven't gone from the mind of God to the mind and acts of man and woman. Okay, so we need the next chain, and the next chain here in your notes is called translation, and it's the putting of the original language manuscripts 
into other languages, into other languages. Now, in English, let me put that transmission, and I'll add that on this chain here, translation, the third chain link, translation. Now, I've been told by a member of this class in a previous year, because they looked it up for me, I didn't. I was curious how many English translations there are. At one time, when I looked it up, it was 500. Uh, a few years ago, when this person in the class looked it up, said there are over 800 English translations. Over 800 different English translations. Well, that's incredible. Especially incredible when you consider there are languages that have no translation. Or when I first went to Russia in 1992, Russia um, had just... Uh, collapsed in 1991. I got there. It was very stark, and I had a chance to get in there in a small window of time as a pastor to help train Russian pastors and elders, and they had never had training because, you know, since 1917, the revolution, seminaries were closed and all this stuff, and they had to meet secretly. So I met with these people that had met secretly and in fear of their lives and everything. So I had a chance to teach them what I'm going to teach you next week, hermeneutics and some other things. But we had a problem. They only had one translation of the Russian Bible. Only one translation. And it wasn't a very good one. So when I'm trying to teach, I'm teaching in English through a translator, and I'm saying, in the Bible it says this, and then their translator is going, well, no, it doesn't say that in our Bible. It got very complicated. And other languages have the same thing. And so sometimes you'll have people think that the English translation of the Bible is the Bible. And, you know, there are people that say the King James only, or they'll pick a favorite translation. It's like, well, a translation is a weaker link than the Greek and Hebrew. So you can have mistakes in translation, or you have opinions in translation, or you have... When you translate, you have to pick one meaning for a Greek word that could mean five different things. And you can only put one in there. And that's why often I'll tell you the Greek word can mean this, 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 this. I I'm not trying to give you some hidden thing that nobody else knows. I'm just telling you when a Greek reads that word, that word, he goes, hmm, that could mean this, this, this. In the context, I'm thinking it means this. Well, the translator has to just pick one word out of all those things. So we are very blessed that in English, this link is very strong for us, the translation link, because we have so many English translations, and you can compare them with one another. Now, the question is, from this, you might say, well then, pastor, which English translation should I use, and why do you always use the New American Standard? Someone ask that. <laughs> Someone ask? Okay. Well, just assume you ask that. Why do I use the Amer New American Standard, or what translation should you use? Okay, this is, this is the, uh, the master's level of this class, okay? So if you don't follow all this, that's, you'll have to, have to review it again. But um, it's not in your notes, but I want to just tell you two main things. And one of them has to do with how you translate the text. Okay, so you're going to have to flip your paper over and maybe put this on the other side. How you translate... And the other one is, which manuscripts do you translate? Because as we saw, there are different manuscripts. So you have to decide how you're going to translate it and which manuscripts you're going to use. Well, first, let's talk about how you do it and how you translate it. There are two schools of thought. One school of thought is you translate word for word. If the Greek word says jump, you translate it jump. Greek word says bucket, you translate it bucket. You know, however, word for word. And at first you'd think that makes a lot of sense. The other translation is you translate thought by thought. You don't translate every word. You translate every concept. Let me explain why you might choose to translate thought by thought rather than word for word. I'm going to give you an example from the English. It's not in the Bible. 
But let's suppose you have some type of metaphor or phraseology or idiom, and your translators, your tra the people reading it, don't know what that idiom means. For example, let's say the text says, Peter kicked the bucket. Okay, that's an idiom in English. What's it mean? Peter died. Well, if you're doing a word-for-word -word translation, what are you going to write? Peter, what? Kicked the bucket. And if you're doing a word study on kicking and buckets and everything, you're going to get this text. And if you don't know it's an idiom, you're picturing Peter literally kicking the bucket. A thought-by-thought -thought translation says, what did the author mean? What did he mean? He died. Peter died. So they translate it, Peter died. But if you go to this English translation and try to do a word study on the word died, and you go, what Greek word is used for died? You're going to get the Greek word, kick the bucket. And it's like, well, you know, that doesn't make any sense. So, two schools of thought. So, do you want to know which translations use which one? Yes, okay. So, the, uh, I'm picking up another color. The word-for-word -word translation is the New American Standard Bible. That's the one I normally use. Um, it doesn't mean it's better. It's just easier for me because when I look up a Greek word, there's going to be an English word equivalent to it. And I tried to teach from a thought-by-thought -thought translation, and it was too complicated when I wanted to go to the Greek because I didn't know what Greek... There was no Greek equivalent sometimes. There's no Greek equivalent for died in a thought-by-thought -thought translation. There's no Greek word there because it's kicked the bucket. So this is a New American Standard. This is your King James Version and also your New King James Version. They are a word-for-word -word translation. So when you're in seminary learning Greek and you're going to have to translate some of the Bible in Greek, I mean from Greek to English, you study the New American Standard Bible. <laughs> because if you memorize the New American Standard Bible, you can translate the Greek because it's going to be word for word. If you memorize the NIV, which is thought by thought, you might get a, a B on the test rather than an A. It's not that it's not accurate, it's just that it's a thought by thought. And then there's the New Living Translation. The NIV is closer to word for word than the New Living Translation. New Living Translation tends to be even more thought by thought. And then, if you really want to be out there, you get the Message Bible. And the Message Bible is one man's thoughts on this, and where this would say Peter kicked the bucket, Peter died, he might say... Peter bit the big one, you know, or something very colloquial. And that's the Message Bible. So if you're a new Christian, you might really enjoy reading the Message Bible to get the overall view. If you're a new Christian, or not even a new Christian, devotional reading, New Living Translation, NIV, it's helpful. But if, for me, my opinion, if you're going to start doing a word-for-word -word study, you're going to want to go to one that's more literal. New American Standard, King James, New King James, and then there's ESV and RSV and all these other translations, which I, off the top of my head, not sure where they fit on here, but, um, so, does that make sense? So, some people would say, well, this, this is better or that's better. Well, it just depends. I use both. I find I'd rather read the NIV or New Living Translation devotionally. But if I want to look at a word study, I tend to use New American Standard. King James would do the same thing. But now there's another difference that determines which translation you're going to use, and this is the second thing. You have to decide which manuscripts are you going to translate from. And the King James stands alone. And they pick manuscripts that are called the Textus Receptus. And the Textus Receptus, that's Latin for the received text. And the Textus Receptus are a group of manuscripts that 
a man by the name of Erasmus put together, and they weren't very old. They were Greek manuscripts that were not very old, and we'll read about them in a minute. I'm going to see if I can do it from the top of my head. Um, yeah, they were from the 12th century. So some manuscripts all go to the 2nd and 3rd and 4th century, but these manuscripts are from like the 12th century, and he compiled them in the 15th century. I mean, he translated them in the 15th century, and he didn't have all the Greek manuscripts for the book of Revelation, so instead of using the Greek, he translated from the Latin Vulgate. And this created the Textus Receptus, which eventually, I mean, you put those manuscripts together. These were Greek, the Textus Receptus. They're all Greek, but when he didn't have a Greek text for part of Revelation, he used Italian and he translated, or Latin, he translated into Greek. These are all Greek. But the King James used these manuscripts that were not the oldest one. Well, we have manuscripts from the 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, 10th century. Lots of manuscripts. So all these other translations use a different set. And this is called the, and it has, it has two names. One is called the, it can be called the critical text. And it can be called the eclectic Text. I know this is really exciting stuff. This is doctoral level now. If you're still with me, you're going for the doctorate. Okay? And what these people did, they looked at every Greek manuscript everywhere and used certain guidelines and rules to figure out which must be the original. Things like a scribe is more likely to add something than to delete it if it's a whole phrase. And the idea is, he's like a, like a study Bible. He's more likely to insert something to help you understand something. So the longer text to them is usually the inferior text. And that's one theory. Do, are they right? Well, we don't know. So I'd like to read some notes here that I gave you a handout. It's one of the clearest presentations of this situation that'll help you understand that two ways to translate, word by word, thought by thought. Does that make sense? And then, what are you translating from? Which documents are you going to pick? Are you going to pick the Texas Receptus, which were a few documents that are not very old, the King James did that, or are you going to pick the critical text, the eclectic text? So let's look at pages 17 and 18 in your notes. Textual criticism, what is it? And I'm going to read this, so please follow along. Simply stated, textual criticism is a method used to determine what the original manuscripts of the Bible said. Remember, we don't have them, so we're trying to find out what they said. The original manuscripts of the Bible are either lost, hidden, or no longer in existence. What we do have is tens of thousands of copies of the original manuscripts dating from the 1st to the 15th centuries. Uh, for the New Testament, and from the 4th century B.C. to the 15th century A.D. for the Old Testament. In these manuscripts, there are many minor and a few significant differences. Textual criticism is a study of these manuscripts in an attempt to determine what the original reading actually was. So that's important because I preach a sermon and say, well, you know, we're not sure what the original text said, but it looks like it says this, and then someone says, you don't believe the Bible. And it's like, no, I actually believe the Bible more than you do. <laughs> you know, I'm trying to find out what the original Bible said. You're thinking that your English translation is the original Bible. It's not. Does that make sense? So when I tell you there's a verse in your Bible that may not be in the original Bible, I'm not denigrating the Bible. I'm actually elevating it by saying we're getting back to what the original really was. And I'll show you that in a moment. I'll show you some passages in your Bible that may not be there or maybe shouldn't be there. And I'm not a heretic. I'm just telling you what the textual critic said. I'm quoting the other people. Okay? There are three primary methods to textual criticism. Okay, he's going to tell us three. I told you two. You'll see in a minute why I didn't tell you the third one, but now you're going to learn it. There are three primary methods to textual criticism. The first is the textus receptus. That's the one I mentioned on the board there. The Texas Recepsis was a manuscript of the Bible that was compiled by a man named Erasmus in the 1500s A.D. 
he took the limited number, that's key, limited number of manuscripts that he had, and they were from the 12th century or the 1300s, um, he had access to, and he compiled them into what eventually became known as the Textus Receptus. So these are Greek manuscripts. The Textus Receptus is the textual basis behind the King James and the New King, King James. Those are, the, those are the two that use it. So when you have a King James only friend, most of them don't know that that's why the King James only people hold to the King James only. They think it's because of the English or some other thing. It's the manuscripts that King James used, which were not very old. A second method is the majority text. This is the one I did not tell you about, and you'll see why. The majority text takes all of the manuscripts that are available today, compares the difference, and chooses the most likely correct reading based on which reading occurs the most. So you might think, well, the majority's always right. <laughs> well, no. And we'll see a bit later why the majority isn't necessarily right. If you have one faulty manuscript and it's copied more than one good manuscript, well, that doesn't make the majority right. So we see here uh, on the majority text, for example, if 748 manuscripts read he said and 1429 manuscripts read they said, the majority text will go with they said as the most likely original reading. Note this, there are no major Bible translations that are based on the majority text, none. Okay, so that is a method, but nobody used that method because they realized, mm, you just could, the majority can be wrong. Here's the third method, which we talked about as our second method. The third method is known as the critical or eclectic method, critical or eclectic. The eclectic method involves considering external and internal evidence for determining the most likely original text. So what are external and internal evidence? Well, external evidence makes us ask these questions. In how many manuscripts does the reading occur? What are the dates for these manuscripts? In what region of the world were these manuscripts found? Internal evidence prompts these questions. What could have caused these varying readings? Which reading can possibly explain the origin of the other readings? And then they mentioned that the New International, the New American Standard, the New Living Translation, and most other Bible translations use the eclectic text. So which method is more accurate? That's where the debate begins. When the methods are first described to someone, the person typically picks the majority text as the method that should be used. It is essentially the majority rules and the democratic method. However, there is a regional issue to consider here. In the first centuries of the church, the vast majority of Christians spoke and wrote in Greek. Starting in the 4th century AD, Latin began to become the most common language, especially in the church. Starting with the Latin Vulgate, the New Testament began to be copied in Latin instead of Greek. Your next page, page 18. However, in the Eastern Christian world, Greek continued to be the dominant language of the church for over a thousand more years. Now, that's going to be important. They're still speaking Greek for a thousand more years. As a result, the vast majority of Greek manuscripts are from the Eastern or Byzantine region. Why? Because they still spoke Greek. They still wrote the Bible in Greek for a thousand years more than the other people. So there are more Greek manuscripts in that part of the world because they didn't stop speaking Greek. These Byzantine manuscripts are all very similar to each other. They likely all originated in the same Greek manuscripts. While being very similar to each other, the Byzantine manuscripts have numerous differences with the manuscripts found in the western and central regions of the church. So it essentially boils down to this. If you started with three manuscripts, one was copied 100 times, another was copied 200 times, and the third one was copied 500 times. Which group is going to have the majority rule? The third group, of course. However, the third group is no more likely to have the original reading than the first or second group. It only has more copies. The critical eclectic method of textual criticism gives equal weight to the manuscripts from different regions despite the manuscripts from the East having the overwhelming majority. So the majority does not rule. Um, there are some passages, they mention John 5, 1 to 9, um, in the text here. And look at, look at John 5. This, this is interesting. 
It's a text that you've read before, you're familiar with, and this will give you an example of what happens, how you have to figure out which text you're going to use in your translation. So in John 5, we have the, the man at the pool of Bethesda that Jesus is going to heal. And remember, we know the story that an angel comes down and stirs up the pool, and if he gets in while it's still bubbling, he gets healed. So let's pick it up in chapter 5, verse 1 of John. After these things, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew, Bethesda, having five porticos. In these lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame, and withered. And then we come to verse 4, and I don't have it in my Bible. My Bible says, see, marginal note. And so I go to the marginal note, and it says, Many authorities insert, wholly or in part, that he was waiting for an angel of the Lord, or an angel of the Lord, went down at certain seasons into the pool, stirred up the waters. Whoever then first, after the stirring up of the water, stepped in, was made well from whatever disease with which he was afflicted. So what the textual criticism does, and the people of the eclectic text says, that was a commentary by someone who put that in so you'd know why the man wanted to get in the pool while it was bubbling. Because you don't know that they believed that an angel made it bubbling. It could have just been gas coming up, and they just thought it, they thought it was an angel. And so not very many manuscripts have that verse in them. And so you'll read through your Bible, and some will say, the New American Standard takes out X number of verses of the Bible. And it's like, no, they weren't probably in the Bible. They were like a study Bible or a commentary when the scribe or whoever was copying it, um, copied it, he might have put in a column or on the side or underneath the verse his comments in like verse 4. Does that make sense? And you have other passages. Um, since we're in John, go to John 7.53. And John 53, John 7, 53 is the last verse before chapter 8. And in my Bible, there's a marginal note on verse 53. John 7, 53. And it says in the marginal note, John 7, 53 to 8, 11 is not found in most of the old manuscripts. It's not there. It's in some, but most don't have it in there. And so that whole story of the woman caught in adultery could be a true story it's a nice story but it's not in most of the Greek manuscripts but if I were to come and preach and go that's not part of the Bible people say Pastor Frey doesn't believe the Bible well of course I believe the Bible I'm just saying that it's not in every Greek manuscript in fact the most Greek manuscripts don't have it the most reputable Greek manuscripts probably don't have it either look at Mark the Gospel of Mark at the end we have the short and we have the long ending of the Gospel of Mark. And you get to Mark. And verse 9. Mark 16, verse 9. Chapter 16, verse 9. And there's a marginal note. Some of the oldest manuscripts omit, omit from verse 9 through verse 20. 9 to 20. A lot of manuscripts don't have that. And so if you look at your Bibles, look at the notes, depending on your study Bible, you'll see that they're trying to say, hey, we don't know for sure if that was part of the original. So we go back to these links. Translation. Each link gets a little bit weaker. So translation is link is only as strong as a translation, and it's only as good as the manuscripts that you used to do the translation. Now, please, please, please don't misunderstand me. You can trust your English translation. You should live by it. We are so blessed to have great English translations. But when someone says your English translation is slightly different than another English translation, or slightly different than this Greek manuscript, it's not changing your doctrine it's not changing huge things normally. You know, it's, it's things like helping you understand that the water got stirred or there's been an explanation. 
But those are the difference in translations, and every translation has to take those things into account, whether it's going to be word by word, thought by thought, which manuscripts they're going to use. And most English translations, other than the King James, use what's called the eclectic or critical text of the Greek. Does that make sense? So then you have the rest of the links, and we'll finish up with this tonight. Um, so translation is the putting of the original language manuscripts into other languages, and in our case, that would be English. And then we have three steps here on your link. I, um, I have to ma- happen to make them two links, but we have observation, interpretation, and application. And observation is looking to see what is written. And I'm going to write observation on the second to last link, observation. You have to look to see what is written. So until you see what's there, it hasn't done you any good. But then interpretation is the art and science of understanding what the author wrote and expressing that meaning into everyday language. So you have to understand it. And we'll add interpretation to our second to last link. So you have to see what's there and you have to understand it. So if you don't understand what's been written, it still hasn't gotten into your mind and it hasn't changed the way you live because you didn't understand what you read. Now, we mentioned before that we have the Holy Spirit and the doctrine of illumination, and so the Holy Spirit helps us observe and interpret the Scripture, and that's why we should pray and ask the Holy Spirit, say, please help me understand what I'm reading here. Um, And God uses people with the gift of teaching and study to help us understand. That's why he gave us those gifts for people like me to help you understand the text. It's part of things because we need to interpret it correctly. Now, you might ask, well, how do we know that Pastor Perry's interpretation is correct and not Pastor so-and-so's? Well, next week, I'm going to teach you the most important thing I may teach you in this entire series. It's called hermeneutics, and hermeneutics is a fancy word. It's a Greek word for interpretation. But, of course, you have to use a Greek word because that makes it sound, you know, more erudite or something. So we're going to study hermeneutics next week, and we're going to show you five principles on Bible interpretation. And if you understand these five principles, you will be a better Bible interpreter than most or many um, people who try to interpret the scriptures, even online or on TV, because they don't follow certain principles. So we're going to study those next time. That's interpretation. It's understanding the text. But you've observed it, you understand it, but there's still one more link, and that's application. You have to apply it to your life. So application is taking what God has said and doing it, and doing it. And as you've heard me say before, perhaps, quoting Dr. Howard Hendricks from Dallas Seminary, one of my professors, he said, God doesn't just want us to be smarter sinners. It's not enough just to know more. He wants us not to be sinning. He wants us to change our actions, not just be smarter. So if you live in church and you're just smarter, what good is that? You want your life changed by the Word of God. And so I would encourage you, when you study the Word, when you have a devotional in the morning or in the afternoon or evening, when you have to do it, or all three times, that you make sure that you figure out, how am I going to apply this? How does it relate to me? How does it relate to other people? How does it relate to my relationship to God, my relationship to the devil, the relationship to my neighbor? We need to apply the Scriptures Or we haven't correctly gone from the mind of God because God doesn't want us just to know things. He wants us to respond to them and act accordingly to the things that we know. And every one of these links are important, but the weakest link is you at the very end. Are you applying it? And so God has made sure that we we have an extremely accurate text in the English He's, he's watched over it. He's gotten it to us. We have it. It's right here. I mean, this is absolutely incredible that we can know what God is thinking by his word. But we have to make sure we observe it, we interpret it, and we apply it, and we live it out. Okay, we're going to stop there for tonight. And next week, oh, two weeks, sorry. Next week's Thanksgiving. So in two weeks, we'll look at hermeneutics. And we'll talk about these five mandatory steps in understanding and interpreting the scriptures. So if you're going to miss a class, don't miss two weeks from now. Um, 
I mean, you can watch it online perhaps, but if you're able to be here, I think you'll find it extremely helpful. Let's pray, and then if you have some questions or relevant comments after the camera turns off, I'll take those. Let's pray. Again, Lord, we want to thank you for your word and getting it to us. And we pray, Lord, that you'd help us to understand your word and to live it out in our lives, that people would see us shining as lights in the darkness for the glory of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen and amen.